Welcome to another edition of Mr. Nice Guy. I'm Ben Slowey, um, here in my basement. Um, roommates teaching piano lessons upstairs, so uh, we may do down here. Uh, and uh, I've got my good friend in the house, uh, his name is Dan Heft. Uh, he I said that right this time, right? No, it's it's Haft. It's Haft. We've Fuck. known each other for so long. Fuck. Damn. That's all good. It's Man. German and it's O-E, so it looks like Ho, sure. but it's pronounced Haft. Well, I feel like, yeah, I imagine you run into that a lot, like people. Oh, all the time. Yeah. I just go with it. For sure. Yeah. Well, uh, Dan Haft is, is in the house. Uh, he's a friend of mine that I've known since my junior year of college, and uh, he, uh, we had our Arab-Israeli conflict class together. Yeah. Uh, that's how we initially came into contact, but we bonded over, you know, um, music a lot and politics and uh, just all-around good guy. He works at the Stone Creek Coffee uh, down in the 88.9 building. Yeah. Um, so I want to welcome Dan to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, <laughs> I mean, we could have an episode about Arab-Israeli conflict, but that would be we could. probably a long... Right. A longer episode. Yeah, 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 because it's it's a lot to unpack, and yeah. I uh, I do I feel like I do that enough on the show with uh, other guests, which is fine. You yeah, know, I, it's a topic that has uh, come up on the on the show, but uh, I encourage everyone to take the class if they go to school at UWM. I agree. It's a and it's an important topic to take a class on. Yeah, and even just learning more about it on your own. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's. A definitely an interesting topic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, uh, we've got some yerba mate. Yeah. Uh, Shout out uh, Joey Flamanowitz and Charlie Sprinkman. Two of my friends work for Guayaki and uh, hooked it up with some mate. Oh, uh -huh, yeah. Um, so Sweet. that's, I think, Rebel Berry. This is yeah. Enlightened Mint. I'm a big fan of the mint one, but oh, very nice. a lot of caffeine and uh, Guayaki is a environmentally conscious company. They do a lot of work um, preserving the Amazon rainforest. Oh, really? Um, awesome. Yeah, and I'm sure that they'll be on campus and in Milwaukee this summer. Sure. Or now fall, I guess. Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Well, cheers, dude. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, man, thanks for bringing these. Mm-hmm. That is good. Um, that is very tasty. And, but they do a lot of preservation, uh, focusing on, like, replanting and sustaining um, Amazon oh, rainforest. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It also says... Shake gently, serve chilled, do not serve to pregnant breastfeeding women. I see. Because uh, it's a lot of caffeine. Oh, right. Yeah, um, sure. Well, but, we're, we're about to be wired, yeah? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, we got got another one in the chamber, too. Yeah. Uh, but it says, yeah, how is it? Guayaki. Guayaki's mission is to steward and restore 200,000 acres of rainforest and create over 1,000 living wage jobs. Yeah, which is yeah. great. But, uh... On the topic of caffeine, yeah, you're a big coffee drinker. Quite. Uh, how do you like your coffee? <laughs> um, so I have evolved, uh, like over time with my uh, iteration of coffee. Um, but I drink it like with uh, I have Folgers uh, that that the I'm drink. The old Folgers? Yeah, the Folgers. Yeah. Uh, but I usually just take it with a, about an inch of milk. Uh, I prefer almond milk, but 2% is fine, too. Um, I I mean, I can drink it black, but I just... Usually, like, I just need something to cool it down. It's not even about the flavor. It's just so hot at it, you know? You're reading my mind. This is, like, my whole concept. Like, I love black coffee, and I love doing different... Like methods, AeroPress V60 Chemex, um, drinking it black, but uh, in the morning if I'm rushing somewhere I'll make a V60 mm -hmm. um, and I want to drink it right away. If I put it in one of the insulated yeah. mugs, yeah. I have to pregame it with some milk, oh, otherwise yeah. it's going to be too hot. Right, yeah. yeah, otherwise I'm just leaving, yeah. le letting it sit for like 10 minutes and I'm like, okay, like I need to wake the fuck up, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know? What is uh, your opinion on oat milk? Overrated, underrated? Uh, uh... I don't know, I, well, like, oat milk as opposed to, like, almond milk. Yeah, what, what is your... I can't say I've actually really had oat milk, to you, be honest. You gotta try it. Is it? You gotta try okay. Oatly oat milk. There's sure. Pacific brand, 
and it's kind of like the schnickel fritz okay. of uh, oat milk, but it's really good. Big fan of it in hot lattes. Ooh. Iced is a little weird. Is that a like a Stone Creek? You have it? We don't have. We have Pacific brand, um, but like. I think Kickapoo has Oatly, and then there's a new place that opened up called Canary. Oh, wow. Uh, down in downtown, and I think they have it there as well. Oh, totally. but, cool. Yeah. Well, that's good. How do you, so, uh, do you take your coffee similarly then? Like, I'll pretty much just take what I can get. Yeah. Uh, espresso's great. Um, just like black coffee's fine if I don't have creamer to like, cool it down. Yeah. Um, but like a traditional cap, mm -hmm. one shot of espresso, five ounces of milk for me is the perfect ratio. Oh, that, oh well, yeah. You've got the the exact uh, proportions down and everything. Well, yeah. Well, like, you're the barista, so you also were a barista. I was, yeah. But um, but not anymore. Um, I work at Company Brewing now. But when I was a barista, like I was um, sort of also like a take you take what I can get sort of guy. Like I I prefer like having a full like cup of coffee because it's just a comfortability I have with it because I've just been drinking a cup of coffee in the morning for so long mm -hmm. but like when I was working at Starbucks I was you know uh pulling shots of espresso all shift and yeah. I was you know like that's that was like me getting like the actual like espresso fix in me which is a whole different level of like caffeine fix but um but like I don't know I did like I never put just sugar in it anymore. I never I, use like sweetener. Yeah. I never, I never like. I used to do that when I was younger, but I never. I, I don't. It's like, got a certain sweetness that kind of offsets the bitterness I'm yeah. looking for. Mm -hmm. I don't really know what to compare it to because it's like, at least now a taboo right. of just like the taste I'm looking for. Yeah, 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 yeah. I um yeah, but I mean every once in a while I'll go for like you know a really like sugary espresso drink like th you know like. Uh, especially like this time of year, you know, the festive pumpkin spice shit and like Christmas, like a peppermint milk is always good. But, but I usually like, I just, I'm fine with a uh, cup of coffee with about an inch of milk, uh, preferably almond milk. But, uh, yeah. I don't yeah. Know. How much coffee do you drink a day? Oh, just like one cup. Wow. After working in coffee for so long, it's like, even if I'm opening or something, it's like I'll have one probably like four or five hours into my shift just because um, I don't want like that crash and burn. Yeah. I want to be able to do stuff after work. Mm -hmm. um, and then at night I try to cool it down, but this is um, definitely... It's bad I'm already done. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but um, I I feel that. The, the crash and burn is, is like the hell of of your of a caffeine ad addiction like i'm at three cups a day or so but i've like i like sometimes i only drink two um like usually i just drink two cups in the morning and some like and i won't have any for the rest of the day but if i'm like really busy like if i have to go to work i usually need another cup to like pick me back up and get me like in like my zone so I'll have that around 3 or 4 yeah. p.m. but it's interesting yeah. for like I mean uh, Jonathan Brostoff I think was on the show shout out John yeah yeah shout out JB yes uh, we love it at we love uh, JB but and, uh, he he yeah. doesn't run on any caffeine mm. and uh, he's probably the busiest person I know always in the community which is great yeah he does and, wonderful work out like uh, he's he does wonderful like solidarity work, which I really admire him a lot. And thank you for hooking that up, getting him, getting me in contact with him. Oh, I mean, he's he's always down to do stuff in the community, yeah. and uh, I'm sure it's not the last time that you'll see him. I, yeah, right. Maybe you'll see him on the other end because he does a uh, state rep in on uh, the River West page, and they're always looking for people mm -hmm. um, to interview and talk to in the community. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he requested coconut water, but I got him the wrong. I got him the right brand, the Foco. But it was like some other weird fruit drink. It wasn't the coconut water, and he oh. he didn't fuck with it. So like, really? I, no. So I drink his too. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What do you think societally has like uh, made us so like ha has it ensured such a caffeine dependence? You know, like why do you think everyone is just so rigged on caffeine all the time? I think well, it's partially how the U.S. looks at a work week 
Uh, and then I think partially maybe it's self uh, awareness of what people want to get done mm -hmm. and what they think they need to get done. Like I don't think the 40 hour work week exists anymore. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of people are putting in more time because uh, an eight to five is no longer cutting it, right? Yeah. Like you need to put in more hours if you want to get somewhere in your career, you're told that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, alive and well right now, you are working at company, you're doing the show. Right, yeah. Um, but that's another thing, trading yeah. off passion between like making a living, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, I've done a couple unpaid internships, and that's one thing that I'm very passionate about is the trade-off between having to do unpaid work as experience and being able to afford rent. Like, right. where does that trade-off exist? I don't think experience really pays the bills. Yeah. And, uh, These days, yeah. it doesn't, at least. At least not, not as much as it should. Yeah, and the requirements from... Uh, the federal government on what an unpaid internship can be is that the person receiving the internship is gaining more experience than the company is profiting off their mm -hmm. work and uh, it's a very lucrative way of measuring what the trade-off is. Yeah, so in turn, so uh, how does that relate back to how much coffee we're all drinking? Oh, well, <laughs> I mean if you're working an unpaid internship, let's say 10 hours a week, you go to school full time, uh, and then you have a part time job. I think that coffee plays an important role. Yeah, right. So maybe one cup, like how you were saying, like yeah. one cup in the morning, one in the afternoon. Right. Um, I think it's a lot of the overstimulation we feel these days. Like, I mean, as, as the, <clears throat> the influx of like, you know, technology and just like how big our population has expanded like you know over many like periods of time like everyone's in more and more of a hurry yeah um and i think that that makes us just like you know we run out of steam a lot more easily um because you know back way back when like before you know in ancient civilizations like people were living very nomadically they were like were they living in fomo like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, without social media, right? Yeah. Are they, like, seeing what's going on right. around them and feeling that, too? Right, and they were just a lot more, like, um, like, self-sustaining. Like, they had to find resources to survive on, and, like, now it's, like, we have such dependences on things that are so, like, readily available to us and what are, what's so accessible mm -hmm. to us. And, like, coffee is something, I mean, it's everywhere, you know? Like... It's, it can be in your kitchen, like, you have a coffee pot or a Keurig. Yeah. Uh, fuck Keurigs, though. Um, <laughs> shit coffee. Um, but, you know, there's... Even take River West, for example. There's so many coffee shops here. There's Fuel. There's Collectivo. There's um, many... There's, like, Bremen Cafe. Yeah. There's, you know, there's uh, a lot of bars and restaurants around here also serve coffee, too. Like, coffee is just, like, you can get it so many places around here and I think that like because like everyone is just in a hurry so much all the time like it makes us that much more like easily burnt out and tired and just emotionally overwhelmed yeah and the coffee is just like it's so it's become such a profitable industry because you know it's because so many people just depend on something that's gonna kick them back up into keeping up with everything you know yeah but on the flip side of that i also think there are some perks to the reliance on coffee and uh like the industry itself like i think that coffee is a good common point like you're able to say hey let's meet for coffee yeah and it's a social coffee. catalyst yeah. yeah 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 and uh even if it's not coffee, it's tea, decaf tea, yeah, right. um, just stuff like that, so it's... Yerba mate. Yeah, yerba mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, right, sure, yeah. Um, I've, I've heard that, you know, how coffee's, like, such a big thing in Seattle, yeah. like, with Starbucks headquarters and everything, like, I heard that the reason for that is because, um, because, like, it rains so much there, and people, as a result, like, I guess, like, this, like, a there's a study that, like, when it rains or when it's, you know, when there's not as much sun, people just get more tired and lethargic. So, like, they're replacing that, that, um, they're replacing, like, the, the sun light that they're not getting as much, that vitamin D or whatever. Like, yeah. they're, uh, 
replacing that with caffeine. And I think also a lot of it has to do with what can you do for your free time. Mm -hmm. um, can you go in a park and work on something on your computer, or if it's raining, are you going to go to an indoor space where they have Wi-Fi? Like, right, yeah. uh, I was in San Francisco last week, and I was lucky because the weather was great. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that just amazed me is I went to this place called Dolores Park okay. with a couple friends, and there's no music going on, there's no event there, it's literally just a park with a thousand people hanging out, just mm -hmm. enjoying outside, and I think that's one of the benefits of living on the West Coast, where in the Midwest Coast, um, it's a little harder to find things to do in winter. Right, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's yeah, coffee true. is a good way uh, to like find a meeting point. But mm -hmm. in the Midwest, besides getting coffee um, and going to like your local drinking establishment, are there these other places that you can go? Right. Um, yeah. Well, that's that yeah. super valid. And I think that uh, I can't think of what it's called, but it just opened on the east side. Um, it's like a. It is a bar, but it also has like adult games. Like it has like a adult foosball. Um, it's and, not a punch bowl oh, social, is it? No, it's called Hangout Milwaukee. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, and that's a cool alternative. Oh yeah, um, yeah, totally. Or like things to do as well. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I'll have to check that one out. I didn't know that. Do you know where it is? Yeah, it's uh, on Farwell, right by Brady, where Farwell oh, cool. and Brady meet. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Now they've got up down over there too. Like um, there are some really fun, like uh, just like like adult fun things to do on the east side these days. Like the the axe bar, the the cat cafe, yeah, the true. underground like like the nine below. Like I under, haven't been there. But I, I haven't either. Cool yeah. Things, yeah, right. The underground like golf course, mini golf. Uh, yeah, no. I mean, there's some there's some uh, happening things out here in on the east side, but yeah. Um, and there's, I mean, all over Milwaukee, the DNC is coming in 2020. Yes, correct. Uh, so get ready for the worst four days of traffic of your yeah, life next year. Real. But it's putting up putting us on the map, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and uh, Tom Barrett is yeah. r running on that. That it's putting Milwaukee on the cool. map. Um, I believe Lena Taylor, who's a state senator, is actually mm -hmm. going to challenge him. In the mayoral election in 2020, well, so sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, I just saw that. Uh, that got announced the other day. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it'll be interesting. I think Tony Zelensky is running too. Mm -hmm. um, he's from Bayview, but there's a lot of stuff going on in 2020, and I don't know if you can see my pin on here, but I am a Elizabeth well, Warren supporter. Hell yeah, man. I'm all in. Um, have you looked into 2020 at all? Sure. Are you kind of. Uh, yeah. So I'm glad we're. Yeah. I. You're the you're the guy to talk politics with because I think that I'm just starting to really pay attention more. Um, I watched the first Democratic debate. I did not get a chance to see the second one, um, but I have been I've been paying attention. I've been trying to get to know the candidates more personally and just more like mm -hmm. in depth. And um, I'm not there's still a lot. I'm not totally polished on, uh, largely because there's just so many people on the stage still right now, but yeah. right now my top three candidates that I support are Bernie, Warren, and Buttigieg. Okay. Um, those are my top three. And I think, well, we still have about 2,000 candidates, right? Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's like going to a restaurant and being overwhelmed by a menu. Like, there are a lot of good options, but which one's the best? Right. And I you think, have to read about all the ingredients and in yes. all of them to see what tastes best. Yeah, and where they're processed and mm -hmm. yeah, what's going on with that. But <laughs> I think, um, I mean, in the next month or so, we'll see a couple more people drop out, and it'll really... Um, open up for the candidates who maybe haven't had a platform or like haven't been able to get as much press time yeah. because of so many candidates. So we'll see. But a big thing I'm passionate about is like voter turnout and this the that people are actually like you know like uh, exercising their right that you know many people you know, fought for, fought for our freedom to do so to democratically elect our politicians. And like when people don't vote, um, it's essentially like, you know, A, like they don't have a right to complain. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of that has to do like when I go and vote, I think of my friends and family around me, specifically my mom, who 
went through Act 10 under Walker because, I mean, he was, that was during his first term um, and thought that she was going to lose her job, right? Like, I vote for her because she gave up her voice so I could speak. Um, that was right around the time that my dad had passed away and she was so nervous to lose her job she didn't go up to protest or anything. Um, she was nervous because it was my sister and I and she was a newly single parent, so mm -hmm. when I think of voting, I think of making sure that I'm voting for a candidate that supports women, people of color, yeah. communities that have been disenfranchised, and um, I think that part of the conversation too is that we need to talk with people who say that they don't vote because they don't think their vote matters and talk with them about the community around them because right. more often than not, someone in their community is negatively affected by the current administration uh, more, yeah, more often than not, like pretty yeah. much everyone. Uh, for example, my sister's boyfriend is a soybean farmer. Okay. Uh, he does some carpentry on the side, but he's been, the last two years, been getting hit hard because of um, the trade war with China and the tariffs. So he's um, been struggling with doing, like, selling to the middleman um, mm -hmm. who does ship it over. So, I mean, even that, like, you can see what a current administration is doing and try to apply it back and get those people in the voting booth. Yeah, yeah like kind of piggybacking off everything you're saying, like people don't vote for either of two reasons. Like A is that they just don't even like they just don't understand like the impact of their decision not to vote that like you know, you might not believe that your life is going to directly like change like depend like whether or not you make a decision to vote. Um, but, you know, whether you directly, whether your own life directly or indirectly does change as a result of the election, like, there's many people like your sister's boyfriend, um, who do have, like, you know, real outcomes based on who is in office making executive mm -hmm. decisions. So, like, you know, um, so, like, they don't, people just don't really understand, like, just how... They don't fathom the importance of it, and also the second reason is that um, that, and this was especially apparent in the 2016 election, was how you know people don't believe in like picking the lesser of two evils. They don't want to pick their poison, and they don't want to like. They just felt very disillusioned mm -hmm. by who their choices were, which were you know. A lot of people weren't happy to vote for either Hillary or Trump. I voted for Hillary. I wasn't particularly happy or excited about it. And, like, it was our, also our first uh, election to be able to vote in yeah. legally. So, like, you know, no one was really, like, I mean, there were, there were Hillary supporters that were excited, obviously. But many people really wanted Bernie to win. And, and I, yeah. he didn't. That was... Uh that's a whole nother conversation right, yeah, too, yeah, with yeah. the Democratic Party. Um, yeah, the whole DNC shit. Like, I, I think that, and th that's another thing, is that people just feel very, like, discouraged when a candidate that they don't feel is representative of their values is representing the party that they have identified yeah. with. And, I mean, in 2018, I think we see the first movement of that with uh, AOC. Yeah. Um, she out-primaried uh, the fourth highest ranking Dem member who maybe would have become um, the House chair. Mm -hmm. And she did that because she was on the ground, she was talking to people in the community, and she was seeing what's at stake and what their problems were. Uh, I think in 2016 there wasn't a lot of groundwork done in Wisconsin that could have been done. I think we're seeing more people now getting energized, especially organizations who are registering people to vote, like Black Leaders Organizing for Communities and uh, LIT. Um, so I think that now people are seeing like what we can do in Wisconsin right. and what issues matter. Uh, right. For and example, like uh, Medicare, um, the Medicare expansion for the biannual budget didn't go through. Uh, Tony Evers can um, get it done in some sense, but that's an issue that affects a lot of Wisconsinites. I think 72% done by an, a an AP poll said that 72% of Wisconsinites support a Medicare expansion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that when Republicans play into that, um, they are losing the battle for their constituents. I think it's a value that we all share, that we want better health care for our kids, better health care in our communities. Um, 
So I'm hoping that the Dems do better, but yeah. the only way that we can make sure is uh, by organizing and right. getting people out to vote. Yes, totally. Um, which is exactly what you're doing. So tell me. Um, so tell me. So you're wearing a Warren pin. Yes. Uh, Elizabeth Warren. Um, what? So I guess yeah. Like what uh, really drew you to uh, want to campaign for her? Because I know like you're working on her campaign and stuff, like or getting people you know, uh, behind her. So yeah, like, tell me about why, you why you're choosing her. So I had read her 2017 book, This Fight is Our Fight, and I really connected with it, with my family background, middle class, um, one working parents, and uh, I think that it's important that people don't strive to be politicians. I think they will, should work to bring change to their community, whether it's through business, um, the nonprofit sector, or eventually becoming a politician, and she worked most of her life um, as a legal scholar, and then realized how big of a problem Wall Street was uh, in not protecting the middle class and expanding the one percent. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2007, she had created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, which works to ho hold Wall Street accountable. And um, she didn't strive to be a politician; she always wanted to be a teacher and I have mad respect for teachers. Yeah. Shout out my mom, public school teacher. Oh, yeah. Um, and all of her policy that she's put out is very thorough. Um, it's trying to work and reform a system that has been played out and let go of by um, the 1% uh, PACs and super PACs. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't donate any, or she doesn't accept any um, PAC or super PAC money. It's all grassroots donations. And I actually found this out, 70% uh, of her first-time donations are from people who have never donated to a political campaign before. Oh, wow. And That's pretty cool, yeah. actually. Wow. She uh, has the largest ground game out of any of the candidates. She's working to make sure that the people um, that are getting their doors knocked on have their voices heard. Mm -hmm. um, it's cool because uh, I was having a meeting with some other people on the community team I work with in Milwaukee. And we were talking about the Medicare expansion, yeah. Um, and then we were able to connect with someone from her team and talk about putting out a statement together. So it shows that like the issues that are affecting the people of Milwaukee and Wisconsin, um, she's working to get yeah. towards those and speak mm -hmm. on those. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah, so I do stuff in Milwaukee, and then I've been working with some teams in Madison and starting some stuff in Kenosha and Racine all over the state. So. Come April 4th, I think that's the primary date. Uh, sure. Yeah, April 4th, 2020. Yeah. yeah it's like coming up. <laughs> yeah. Like, I've always liked Bernie just because, like, he has just had an outstanding track record. Yeah. Which, like, for 40 plus years, he's been fighting for social justice and for pushing towards, like, universal health care and pushing for, mm -hmm. like, you know, holding Wall Street accountable and whatnot. Yeah, I don't think without Sanders we wouldn't be in the conversation of universal health care that we're having. Right, yeah. Like, he has pushed that conversation and taken somewhat of the beating from um, the Republican Party on being, like, the founder of democratic socialism yeah. in America. Right, um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I have respect for Bernie, I have respect for Buttigieg, and I think that if we have positive dialogue about mm -hmm. all the candidates, um, talking about what we like, what we don't like, but not bashing them. That just helps what we're going to be doing on election day. Mm -hmm. um, if we're talking candidates down um, and not talking Trump down, because Trump is by far worse, yeah. um, we're um, kind of just ruining like what the momentum is building for the Dem Party. Right, yeah. yeah. American intervention and imperialism is a very... Uh, you know, it, it's caused much destabilization. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of that has to do with rebuilding the State Department. Uh, Elizabeth Warren has put out a plan to put more money into state and yeah. work to build um, diplomat and residents mm -hmm. so, um, and foreign service officers. Um, and I think a lot of that has to play in that we can't be friends or buddy-buddy with authoritarian regimes, whether it's right. um, Trump with Putin, uh, Kim Jong-un, the Assad regime. Like, we have to drop a fine line on promoting humanitarian issues, not being imperialistic about enforcing those, but making sure we aren't promoting authoritarian regime agendas. Right, and 
largely that's just, you know, pushing our own, like, capitalist system forward with, like, whatever we can, you know, make or save the most money with, you yeah. know? Like, like Saudi, I mean, what Saudi Arabia, for example, yeah. with the oil and everything, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, what we have seen in Venezuela, mm -hmm. uh, the U.S.'s approach on that, and then um, how they're working to solve the humanitarian crisis that's going on there um, just goes to show, like, when are we acting in our own interest or are we acting in humanitarian interest? Right, yeah. Yeah. Right, we can't have, like, and that's sort of, like, that's where the term, and, like, this is, you know, definitely been, like, a contro controversial term, and rightfully so, is, like, that's where, like, the idea of nationalism becomes very problematic, mm -hmm. because it's, like, we're looking at this, you know, we view our country in, like, this, um, chauvinistic way uh, in relation to other countries and other uh, world affairs that our country is the best so therefore like we we only need to like sustain our own interests rather than our rather than the repercussions of our you know foreign relations and everything yeah and I mean if we're gonna talk about our perfect history we should look back that's at, what I'm saying yeah. like democracy takes time to develop and we're far from perfect um, whenever I think of us boasting about how we're the best country in the world I think of the um, what it means to be a slave on the 4th of July by Frederick Douglass right, yeah. um, how evil and heinous that the US has been at points in history yeah. um, and how I mean it's a continuous fight bus for us to be the world police and go around and try to say, hey, we're perfect, you need to do this, mm -hmm. uh, might not be the right way, uh, we need to listen to the people there, what change they want. Yeah, um, right. It, it's yeah. always been, a, and this is sort of like the whole, like, uh, just, I, I think a lot of it just comes from, like, our white privilege, is that we only have ever really listened to our own voices, rather than those of the disenfranchised. Yeah. Um, that goes for any any marginalized community, is like, and it's something that we still deal with individually day to day is that like we have always we as specifically white men yeah. have always felt our voice is like the most important one we always have opinions on things we always feel like we're the ones that should be making decisions about things and like we're at a time where that's being undone like slowly but surely you know especially especially with um our last Congress election, you yeah. know, seeing, you know, like, uh, politicians like, you know, AOC and, yeah. and, and Ian Omar and Rashida Tlaib, but like, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not a pie where if someone gets more pieces of pie, you get less. I mean, like, point being like, we need to hold, I think that like we as the U S like, yes, there's nothing wrong with being proud of our country, but we have to hold ourselves accountable, you know? It's like we have to, like, admit where we have, like, a stake in the wrongdoing of of different demographics of people or in different mm -hmm. countries and shit like that, so... And even on a micro level, like, us holding each other accountable for, like, hanging out with people and, like, seeing uncomfortable situations, right. letting yeah. people who are from communities speak up and we take the seat. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people, so speaking on the election, a lot of people... Um, are already saying like I mean I mean I'm sure this comes from just a place of like hopelessness or of just not getting their hopes up because of what happened in the last election where Trump won and just and it just blew a lot of people like yeah. it caught a lot of people off guard. Um, people are already saying they think Trump's just going to win and there's no question. Well, there's a couple things that go into that. A lot of people use the argument of electability and when I hear that I think of that as a superficial argument I think the groundwork that you lay out makes you electable not the way you look or the place that where you come from um, for instance people are one candidate specifically I think Joe Biden uh, runs a lot on the fact that in polls it shows that he beats Trump um, and that's that's based on his electability former vice president um, tenure as a senator mm -hmm. but I don't know if that's true. I think that Hillary pretty much had all polls showing that she would become president. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it needs to focus more on um, the groundwork that you put in. Like I was saying earlier, like you need to make sure that 
people are turning out for you and you're listening to their voice. Um, I think Warren's campaign follows a lot of what Obama did mm -hmm. uh, in 2008. He worked on the ground, he had a ton of field offices, um, and he worked to talk to people who are independents and maybe a little farther right to see why they're voting that way and like what he's offering. And I yeah. think that um, taking that approach can ultimately be Trump. So talking with your neighbors, talking with people in your community, seeing what the problems are and passing those along to yeah. um, the candidate that's going to listen. Right. Yeah. Also, one thing on that, yeah. uh, shout out Bird Dog Nation. Um, there's this group called Bird Dog Nation, and I don't know if you remember watching the Kavanaugh hearings. I do, um, yeah, yeah. Do you remember uh, the video of Jeff Flake in the elevator and a woman was asking him why he was going to vote for Kavanaugh? Um, he kind of looks like a me, but like was very sad. He ended up not running again, I think partially because of that, but Bird Dog Nation, um, so they hold the, or they work to hold candidates and elected officials accountable, um, whether it's seeing if people are going to vote for certain bills that are in Congress. Um, they have done a lot of work on the opioid crisis, and uh, it's especially a huge thing here. Yeah, and I think that's another reason why we need to talk people into voting or why it's important is because that's affecting almost every community. I have lost two friends to um, the opioid crisis over the last four years, and it sucks. Um, so they work to hold yeah elected officials accountable, and it's cool because yeah. they literally just ask people to come onto their team and go to these places and ask these questions that are hard hitting and need a yes or no answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's, that's another real big thing is the whole, yeah, the pharmaceutical companies. Um, I, do you watch any John Oliver? I don't. I am not a, <laughs> I try to steer away from, uh, political like com like comedy yeah i focus yeah. i like read the news like right. ap and new york times but um yeah i sure uh, yeah. sure sure I, I i do watch a good amount of john oliver but he's done some very like well researched and well mm -hmm. um and just you know well commentated pieces on various political issues um and he did one on the pharmaceutical companies and I'm sure he's done several at this point, but I mean, and we didn't like not only him, but like we also did uh, in my journal, one of my journalism classes uh, here at UWM. Um, I we did like our semester like uh, investigative mm -hmm. piece on the op opioid crisis, and we like talked to um, like uh, we actually went to like a morgue in Milwaukee as a class and talked to somebody who was like a mortician that was there that's like talking about like what they're finding in the bodies of people that have overdosed and um it's just so like it's it is so sickening how these companies are capitalizing off of the addiction mm -hmm. of people yeah. um and like you know these really highly potent and addictive pills uh that are you know getting people to, that are spiraling people into addiction dependence um you know those mo those companies are making shit ton of money off billions of, of dollars yeah, billion yeah. yeah that is like and part of that is the private healthcare industry in whole um yeah because it's a it's a for profit it's, it's right for profit system they're going to be working to make as much profit as possible um at the expense of the consumer so yeah. Yeah, and like I'm, I mean, I'm fortunate. Like I have Bedrick at Plus, and I'm only like um, my copay is a dollar for my medication. But um, it's, but you know, there's many people I know, yeah. like us, that don't have that insurance. And uh, I am allergic to nuts, and I actually had an allergic reaction about a week ago. I had well, to go to the emergency room, but oh, yes. um, glad you're alright. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I had one a couple months ago as well. Uh, so. Pro tip for myself, I need to be more accountable and make sure I know what I'm eating. But uh, mm. when I went home, I was actually, I had the allergic reaction. I ran home and I was going to stab myself with my EpiPen. Uh, it was expired, so I didn't know if I could use it. I ended up going to the emergency room um, and I was put on a three month waiting list. Um, and then per EpiPen right now, it's on the lower end, but it's uh, I think 250 per. Um, 
happy pen you get two per packet oh sure um but the company myran that runs that uh had slowly increased the price up until like 2012 where it was like 750 dollars uh. and now it's going down a little bit but it's ridiculous um because my insurance doesn't cover that yeah um and it's a life-saving medication i need right um well yeah yeah well i'm yeah. glad you uh i'm glad you got that like you're okay and everything yeah um but what are you gonna say i'm just gonna say on the note of talking about politicians um and elected officials one thing that i do see as a positive thing is that former president barack obama puts out his end of summer playlist oh, each year does he oh yeah yes he does i would yeah. definitely recommend checking out he's got pretty good taste in music a little too mainstream for me oh but, sure okay um doesn't he yeah like what, what has he got on it like uh well he had some anderson pack was was cool cardi b oh, wow. um he had hot girl summer uh <laughs> Classic. Yeah, I'm thinking Michelle and him jamming out to it, but oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about yeah. music for you. Yeah, what, of course. What are you listening to right now? What are you into? Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's you and me. We have to get into music yeah. at some point. So uh, right now, um, still trying to keep up with uh, recent releases. Um, I uh, really enjoyed the new Young Thug record. Yeah. Uh, so much fun. Uh, really enjoyed the new Brockhampton record as well. Yeah. Um, I, I, have a, I have a list in my phone of, like, all the discographies I have to listen mm -hmm. to, and, like, I'm visiting, like, a lot of more hardcore, like, experimental shit um, right now, and um, I've actually been getting into this band called Boredoms. Okay. They're a Japanese experimental rock band that is some of the weirdest shit that's ever been put out. It is so bizarre. Oh, yeah. But it's so much fun, though. It's very addictive. It's like, do you know Captain Beefheart? I don't. Okay, it's like the, it was like a, a, it was like an avant-garde like, um, experimental out outfit from the '60s, sort of in the vein of like Zappa, okay, that kind of stuff. Imagine that if it was made in the '90s. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, man. yeah. So I've been listening to Boredoms a lot. Uh, I've been getting into some more hard hardcore punk stuff, uh, industrial mu industrial music like Daughters. Um, I can't get into Daughters, man. No? Yeah. I, I'm i sure that you know oh, yeah. Fantano and he's yeah. all about Daughters. Normal I can't do that. Yeah, yeah. I... So, Norm, for the longest time, like, I wasn't much of, like, a... I liked their newest record because it was more industrial rather than, like... Some noise rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm into that stuff. I'm not as much into, like, the, the technical, like, death metal or hardcore punk stuff, like, mm -hmm. that's really fast-paced and rigorous. I'm not as into that stuff, but, you know, I'm, uh... I, I'm still, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I've been listening to a lot of local music from yeah. covering. Yeah, and big shout out to Ben, because you've oh, been kicking you. ass on the local thank scene, you. and your breaking and entering pieces are great. Thank you. Um, you're helping me stay in the local scene. And, I appreciate it. Yeah. That's about, yeah, that's about it for me right yeah. now. What about you? Uh, well, okay, I gotta say the new Lana Del Rey album is really good. I heard it's good. Um, yeah. Some good songwriting on there, too. Big fan. Venice Bitch, really good song. It's like nine <laughs> minutes. Okay, oh wow. Um... Other than that, one of so one of my friends, uh, Duffy, shout out Duffy, uh, introduced me to one of his buddies when we were skating, Pete Freeman. I know Pete Freeman. Yes, and I listened to his Wisconsin Stories album, and I literally have just been listening to that on repeat the last like seventy two hours. Oh, he's great, man. He's, yeah, uh, he's got. Kind of, I love his voice. He's yeah. got like a really good like country flavored folk voice. And part of that too was that I had gotten super into John Prine this summer. Oh, yeah. Orange by John Prine is pretty good. Um, so definitely trying to get more into songwriting. Um, and I'm trying to think who else. Uh, oh, I was really into this Aldous Harding record. She's out of New Zealand. It's called Designer. Oh, cool, yeah. Which is pretty good. But I went to Pitchfork. And I saw Belle and Sebastian. Oh, yeah, and wow. I wasn't really into them, but the album "If You're Feeling Sinister." I love that great. album. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, part of why I, I just love music is that like you're able to connect with not even new albums, but old albums, and it yeah. like, brings you to like a time in your life or something like that. Oh yeah, right, and it also makes you think about what was going on at that time when it came out. Cause yeah. Uh, "If You're Feeling Sinister" came out in 1996, mm -hmm. and like. I, yeah, like, I, it's just like there were so many different, so much things were going on at that point, like. I was being born, yeah. You're right, yeah. Yeah, yeah that same. was the main thing, actually. Yeah, right, yeah. right, that's the main 
thing that happened that year yeah. uh, in the world. But, um, but like, yeah, in the 90s, it's like we think about, like, golden age hip-hop. We think mm-hmm. about, you know, trip-hop music. We think about the grunge movement. We think about sort of the the foundation of a lot of the indie rock. Just yeah. the I mean, powerful powerhouse acts like Modest Mouse came out around that yeah. time, too, and um, Neutral Milk Hotel. But, yeah, no, Stereo Lab. Oh yeah, they're, well, Stereo Lab played too, but we only caught part of their set. Oh sure, um, they're coming to town in oh, October. Oh really? Yeah. Okay, I also saw Modest Mouse is coming to town, but they're opening for someone. Black Keys. How crazy is that? Uh, that like it comes where I mean the Black Keys are big too, but yeah. um, that Modest Mouse is opening. For yeah, them now. that's I. Yeah. Have you seen them before? Uh, I've seen the Black Keys. I haven't seen Modest Mouse. Oh, okay. Um, the Lonesome Crowded West. Is my favorite. Album. Yeah, same. yeah, it's a great yeah. album. Hard Cook's Brain is like one of my favorite songs ever. Heck yeah, um, yeah. Uh, how was so? You saw uh, Animal Collective on their Sung Tongs tour last year. Oh yeah. What do you think? It was interesting. We had some ambient music open up, which actually I wasn't into at the time. Uh, it was a very low key ambient music, um, but it sparked my interest in Brian Eno. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, Sung Tongs was very cool i've never seen animal collective outside of that performance but based on crowds reaction i mean everyone was very into it Mm -hmm. um and yeah it was in an intimate space yeah it was cool i saw them out in dc yeah yeah right well i'm yeah i ended up catching them in chicago on that sung tongs tour and it was definitely like i mean animal collective shows are like a cult you know, like everyone is a super devoted fan. Yeah, that's yeah. Another great thing about music is that yeah. you're able to find these exactly. niches. I'm actually going to Ride Fest. Um, oh, I think I'm week. I'm going uh, Sunday. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'm going to see Ween. No, I was just going to talk <laughs> about that. Yeah, I I'm going all three days, but uh, I'm definitely going for Ween. Um, also, oh. Flaming Lips are playing. Oh yeah, Yoshimi right. all the way through. Oh fuck yeah! Yeah, I'll probably see you there then. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Hell yeah, dude. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah. I went to see Beck last year at Riot Fest, and that was good. Nice. Uh, this summer, I saw Deer Hunter in Chicago, and I saw King Gizzard, actually, about a month ago. Uh, and Riverside, in, yeah. Oh, okay. Deer. Yeah, I heard that show was really heavy. It was so. awesome. Yeah, it was yeah. like two hours, so I was tired. Did you see anything this summer? Um, I Shout out 88.9. I won tickets to go see Beach House, so oh, cool. I was able to go see them, and then I saw... Charlie Bliss once, um, mm. Divino Nino, which is a Chicago uh, Latinx band, and then um, Girl K opened for them, and oh, cool. I got pretty into them. They're putting, awesome. Well, they haven't announced it, but I think they're going to put out a new album. Um, but yeah, I was able to see a lot of shows this summer. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, I'm excited for the fall. Oh, that's but, tight. Yeah. Fuck yeah, dude. Um, yeah, same here. Um, I'm excited to see Brockhampton when they come to town. Oh, finally! I saw them last year in Atlanta, and I've never sweated through a shirt. Um, oh, it's nice. definitely yeah my first time doing that. Oh, and nice! The concert was very intense, but yeah, it was a dope show. Fuck yeah, man! Yeah. Well, Dan, as we close out, um, what keeps you up at night? Uh, people not voting. Please get involved any way please you can. Vote. If you think your voice isn't being heard, tell someone. Um, and they're more than likely going to connect you with people who are going to show like what's at stake. Um, also like Milwaukee for Warren on Twitter, uh, or follow MKE for Warren on Twitter, like Milwaukee for Warren on Facebook. Um, slide in my DMS. If you want to get involved in the Warren campaign, he's giving um, you permission slide in his DMS. Yes, please slide in my DMS. Um, <laughs> they don't get slid in too often. So right. it'll be a nice change of pace. Yes. But, yeah. Nice. Thank you for having me on Ben. It's always good to see you. What, what puts you to sleep though? Oh, Last night I fell asleep to Fear Fun, um, oh, yeah. side two, on Father John Misty. Yeah, but uh, he's kind of changed. So uh, sure, yeah. yeah, usually ambient music makes me nice. fall asleep, or some instrumental. Oh so, yeah. yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Man. Well, thank you for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, and thank you for the yab- the yerba mate. I am jacked right now. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, yes, everything you said. Vote. Yeah. Uh, really, uh, like our voices count and. Uh, you know, it's now or never. Yeah. Thank you for watching, Mr. Nice Guy. We'll see you next time. Have a good one. Oh.